Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Sex inventory is one of the finest things to use for all of life. And uh, I was two years before I was able to get my first six sex inventory done. My memory wasn't that good, and I was so so screwed up in that area. When I finally got it done, it fit on a three-by-five card. I was amazed that I ever had children. Uh, but the way it is in the big book, it's a conduct inventory. It's not a pornographic inventory. And technically, it's important. The resentment inventory says make a list first. The sex inventory does not. Let's walk into that. Bill talks, of course, about all of us needing a little overhaul there. And some people think we ought to have sex all the time. Some blame the whole troubles of the world on it. We have a myriad of screwed up ideas about this deal. We do not want to be the arbiter of anyone's sexual conduct. That means I'm not to be the arbiter of my own either. One of the most profound things I ever heard was a person who, in giving directions for the sex inventory, told another person, we don't know yet whether God wants you to be a whore or a monk. So, forget what you think you know about it, because it doesn't Now, he hasn't made many of either in AA that I've seen. A few. But, uh, so we reviewed our own conduct over the past, it says. And it's real important, because this is specific. I'm to review my conduct over the past. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? If you answer those questions, the list will make itself. If all I do is make a list of the people I've had sexual relations with, I'm going to miss most of the meat of this inventory. This is about power. The withholding of sex is as much a harmful thing as indiscriminate sex. And we'll miss it if I just make that list. So where have I been selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate? The list will make itself. Whom have I hurt? That doesn't need interpreted. I make a whom I hurt. Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Of course. How did I go about that? That, by the way, is a standard business practice. That's a manipulative tool in many areas of life. Uh, and in this arena particularly, you're not giving me a much enough attention. So I indicate there may be a little dalliance around the corner when you start giving me more attention. It's a manipulation. <clears throat> Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? Oh my. The very question indicates that I probably know the difference between right and wrong now. And the question, what should I have done instead, is almost anything but what I did. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't have to get fancy with that one. But can you see how clearly this lays out for me? Or my amends are going to come from. What should I have done instead? That's what I have to clean up, both directly and in my life. We got all this down on paper and looked at it. So this is another written inventory. I don't have a copy of that because I've got to be honest with you. I haven't had sexual aberration for about 27 years. I married a horny Italian woman, and everything's just fine. <laughs> well, we, we make light of that, but it's the truth. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Please. I don't, not at first, because it doesn't say to do that. 
I'm just following the directions here. It says, I start out by saying, where have I been selfish, uh, dishonest, or inconsiderate? And the list then gets made right there. As I answer the question, that means I don't make a list ahead of time because I'm going to leave some things out if I do. See, we have the mistaken idea that sex is intercourse. That's just the picnic on the journey. We get locked into the picnic and we miss everything that happened on the journey. Most of the harm comes on the journey. Okay. So, uh, men particularly, we're stupid. We are genetically driven. Ladies, that doesn't let you off the hook. So are you. But in a different direction. But we're stupid. The problem I had with women most of my life is that I had learned about women from men who don't know anything about women. <laughs> and what I know about women today and what I know about sex today, I learned from my wife. That's all I know. She doesn't think that's true, but it's true. I was a virgin when I came to her, spiritually. Yeah. <laughs> well, these guys that sit behind you make me nervous. <laughs> in this way, in laying it out this way, we try to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life, or for our future business life, or our future play life whatever it may be, answering these questions helps me set the new ideal. Okay? I don't have to get fancy with it. It's not to find my ideal mate. It's to determine my ideal for my own conduct in this world and in this arena. What a marvelous tool this is. Because all I have to do is look at what I did wrong, and the opposite of that will be the right. Okay? It was in this that I made some interesting discoveries about myself. I am not super stud. Never have been. Never wanted to be. There are other things in life that interest me almost as much. Uh, the older I get, the more of those there are. Uh, I still believe that God created anything better than that. He kept it for himself. But I also have to admit, if he hadn't made it fun, we wouldn't do it. It looks really dumb. <laughs> Hey, it's so weird that we won't even let children watch it. Okay. So, you know, really. We subjected each relationship to this test, whether it be sexual or any other relationship, business relationship, whatever, this is the test. Was it selfish or not? Well, you got me, because in some aspect, absolutely. Yes. But was it selfish or not? We ask God to mold our ideals and to help us live up to them. Same prayer we've been saying. What would you have me do? Now, I carry this into my marriage. This is good when you first come here and you're a sexual maniac. This will guide you and help you. But how about a marriage? The fact is that I, I did marry a lady who really enjoys me and our activities, and that includes sex. That does not mean that I have proprietary rights over her body and can have sex any time I want. That's selfish. It would be selfish. There was a... I listen to anyone who has something spiritual to say, and there was an old Assembly of God preacher used to come into that penitentiary. And I could never have that experience. I made myself available to it time and time again. It just didn't happen for me, but I did discover some things. I love old hymns. I love to sing. If we can get a chorus of We Shall Gather at the River, I'm with you. Uh, I just love it. And this old man was a truly spiritual man. No matter what he called himself, we knew that, and we would sit with him and let him talk with us and ask him questions. And he mentioned one day that there were times he had doubt, and I still had the spiritual illusion that all spiritual people, there's no more doubt or temptation. It's, uh, you know, you get your tweed jacket with the leather patches on the elbow and the house up on the side of the mountain with the 
overlooking veranda where you sit listening to Mozart coming out of the back room and dispense a little wisdom to the peasants as they go by. <laughs> you have doubts, he said, and temptation. And we said, well, what do you do? He said, when I am in doubt or when I have temptation, I take the master by the hand and I say to him, if I go do this, will you go with me? And if I don't get a solid yes, I just don't go. And I'll either get a solid yes or a solid no. If I don't get an answer, I don't go. It takes a solid yes to go. Now, I was awake enough to know that God is always with me. But the idea was clear. And I've got a stronger test than that for you, the one that I put myself to. Because I'm weaker than that preacher was, I think. If what I'm about to do, could I be, would I be able to do that if my wife were watching, my mother were watching, my granddaughter were watching, and my daughter's watching? That's my test. We don't let our daughters watch our intercourse, but they watch me trying to seduce their mother on a regular basis, and they love it. They know how deeply I love her. I pat her on the rump or blow in her ear. Or I've been known to fall to my knees in front of them and say, thank you, Jesus, thank you. I mean, I'm blatant about it. Because that's playful. And the daughters have got good attitudes about sex. There's nothing to be afraid of. They know I love their mother. We're not going to let them watch. That's private. And besides, I'm fat and ugly. Huh? <laughs> We need to always remember that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good. Neither to be used lightly and selfishly nor to be despised and loathed. To take kind of a neutral thing here. And the key was God gets to be in on this deal too. I'm to practice these principles in all of my affairs. We'd been married, I don't know, two or three years when it occurred to me that I'd never consciously prayed about that. So I stopped for a minute. We're getting ready to go to bed and make love. And I just stopped for a second. In my own head, quietly said, if I go do this, will you go with me? And within me, I heard, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why not? It's his creation, for goodness sakes. Why not? And it has changed our regular life and our sex life. <clears throat> There's nights I have a headache. There's nights she, she has a headache. It doesn't matter anymore. It's part of the journey, and the picnic is a great part of the journey, but it's just the picnic. The fun part is 24-hour day seduction. That's the fun part. I adore her. I let her know that. I have found all of her little weak spots. My favorite is when she's busy cooking to kiss her on the back of her neck. It makes her go, Ooh. Better than cookies, man. Anyway, you get the idea. Find your own way into this. And have fun with it. Our Eskimo friends, their word for sexual intercourse is let us laugh together. Because this is fun. Ooh. <laughs> Whatever the ideal is, ought to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. Again, willingness is the key here. My strength comes from my weaknesses. If I think I am strong, then I will give in to my weaknesses. If I admit my weaknesses, I get strength. It's just the way it works. So I need God more here than anywhere else because this is the second most powerful power source of the human condition. This is the one that drives the whole damn planet. And it can either be used for good or it can destroy everything we're, we're trying to build. <clears throat> 
we must be willing to make amends where we have done harm, provided that we do not bring about still more harm in so doing. Counsel with others. Counsel with sane people, though, if you can find any. Yeah. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. Holy mackerel, do you hear what that says? What's coming next is the solution to every problem I may ever have. That's what it says. Every problem. And here it is. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The rule book just goes out the window. Now I live by principles, not by rules. What worked last week as a rule may not work this week. In any activity I have. But the principle, will this cause any harm? That works every time. <clears throat> the right answer will come if we want it. What should I do about each specific matter? I'm going to apply that to every activity of my life. So, and I've done some bizarre things with that. I believe in practicing prayer and practicing the presence of God. So when I got out of the penitentiary, where they were feeding me, I had no choices there. I used to stand in front of the bread counter at Safeway and practice. I would say, in my present state of health, which of these should I be eating? Because I don't know. And then they let everything go out of focus. And whether it came back into focus first, that's the one I bought. Now, that sounds silly. And I don't think God necessarily takes time out from his day to say, oh, get the rainbow white. I believe it's the practice that was important. I got used to asking God in each situation, no matter what it was, what should I do here? And it becomes a habit. You don't even think of it anymore. Uh, so the first time through, you got a lot of house cleaning to do because we are all sexually weird when we get here. We are. Yeah. Not necessarily terribly sick, but weird. I don't know where you grew up, but where I grew up, we didn't talk about it except on the street with guys who'd never done it before either. <laughs> and girls wouldn't talk about it with us. What the hell are we going to know? So we get weird. Some of us come from an old Quaker background where well, that's really bad news. I have been beaten severely in this arena with rubber hose and things like that. And Many of you have had the same thing because we get some weird stuff in this country. Forget it. It's all lies. Ask God, what should I do about a specific matter? Uh, so I have to learn how to meditate, don't I? I'm going to go on meditation. I have to learn how, and later on we get taught how to do that. This whole business is about prayer, isn't it, lovely? But suppose you mess up. Suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does that mean we're going to get drunk? It depends entirely upon our motive. If we're willing to straighten that out and be taken on to better things, probably not. If we're not sorry and we continue to harm others, we will surely drink. So what is it that will cause me to drink? Not a crisis. Harming others is what's sure to make me drink. Anything that separates me from you is sure to make me drink. Will it be resentment or fear of conduct that separates me from you? I am sure to drink. If I harm you, I am sure to drink. What a wonderful tool God's got. Enlighten self-interest. <laughs> okay. I don't get to even pray for myself anymore except as those prayers may affect how it works with you. But I found a way around that one, by the way. But I found a way to get into that one all the way. <clears throat> I'll give it to you. I need to be filled with a sense of the presence of God. That's all I need. And I know that. And I can't ask for that for me. That's what this says. So here's what I say to him. Please fill me with your loving spirit. And let it flow through me and into the lives of others. And you know what? As long as I'm willing to let it keep flowing, I'm full. What a neat trick. Don't 
don't get rid of your, you can't get rid of your schema anyway. Just let it work. To sum up about sex or any other problem, we earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation. Again, Bruce, how do I know what's questionable? If you're involved in it, it's questionable. Not necessarily negative. Anytime I have two possibilities or more, it's questionable. What should I do? Doesn't have to be negative. Every situation is questionable because life is made up of choices. Go left or go right, go up or go down. It's always questionable. So, pray all the time. It's to be fun. For sanity. Insanity in here is described in the story of the car salesman and Jim as lack of proportion and the ability to think straight. So, sanity would be Proportion, proportion and the ability to think straight. What does that apply here? My genes tell me my whole purpose for being on earth is to repopulate it. So many females, so little time. That's, I'm driven with that genetically. And I get I can get clear out of proportion with that. Okay. This means it's saying I understand that's not just my job. I need to share that. Uh, frankly, it's too big a job for me anyway. And I get distracted by good music sometimes and forget it. <laughs> oh, I do. You can laugh if you want, but I do. Strength to do the right thing. There's there's my deal. I know the difference between right and wrong. What I lack is power, or in this case, the strength to do the right thing. Once I know what the right thing is, quite often the, the feeling I get is, oh, I'm just a little kid. You're asking too much of me. I don't have the strength to do that. By admitting I don't have the strength, and by asking for it, suddenly I get the strength to do the right thing. Now, if I'm busy praying to get the strength to do the right thing, I don't have time to do the wrong thing. This is written for children, because that's who we are. That's what it says. We're children of the Living Creator. You know what I think is funny? What is the children are supposed to do most of the time? Play. But we get serious about this. Lighten up. It's only life or death. God. <laughs> if sex or any other problem is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder in, into uh, helping others. We think of their needs, and we work for them. This takes us out of ourselves, and it quiets the imperious urge when to uh, yield would mean heartbreak, both for me and for other people. I can't stand one more of my own heartbreaks. Along the way here in this, I began to learn the difference between guilt and shame. And there's a very real difference. Guilt is what happens to me when you catch me breaking one of your standards or rules or laws or whatever. Then I feel guilty. And it's very easy to take care of guilt. I just shut up and wait for you to tell me what I have to do to pay the debt. How much time I have to do, how much money it's going to be, what humiliation I have to face. It takes care of the guilt. Shame is when I've just caught myself violating one of my own standards, one of my own principles, and there's no payoff. There is no payoff for that. The only way I can ever get rid of shame is to become the kind of person who can no longer commit that shameful act. And that's the transformation that they do. I can't deal with shame. I just become somebody else. I can't do that. That sounds high and lofty, and it is, but it isn't. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Gert Bahanna. Gert was raised here at the Waldorf. Very, very rich old lady. Bad drunk. <clears throat> uh, 62 years old, she had a Christian conversion experience and stopped drinking. Set herself up a little trust that would keep her alive. She said she wished she had forgot what have remembered about inflation, but went down to Arizona and began working with drunks. And those that she couldn't take care of, she'd send to AA. And six years later, 
uh, in her sobriety, she realized she was sending people someplace where she hadn't been. So she went and became an AA member of the highest standard. Gert was one of those people, the first time I saw her talk was in a cathedral in Denver. Little old lady, late 70s, early 80s. And I knew I was looking into the face of God. That's what she put out. She had that going. She traveled the world just talking about God. Kind of like Fatima does. Some of you know Fatima, you know that you're going to hear about God because she doesn't know anything else. And uh, we had Fatima out to our correction facility, let her talk to the guys for an hour. It took over two hours, and when she left, they asked me to bring her back again tomorrow. But Gert, one time, we were talking about this spiritual stuff, and she was laughing at us, as most people do, young people. She says, being spiritual isn't all that much different. She said, honeys, she called us all honeys. When I was sick, I used to look down on people. Now that I'm spiritual, I look down on people who look down on people. It ain't that much different. Okay. And began to make it real. And that's what's going on here. My ideal is that I keep my promises. I'll do that, I probably won't cause you harm. So I'm very, very careful about making promises. I used to make ones I had no intention or no way, way to keep. And my dad one time near the end of the road gave me this lovely tidbit as a standard. He said, Don, there's only two things that a person really needs to live a good life, an honorable life. And that have to have enough honor to keep every promise you ever make, no matter what the personal consequences. And enough wisdom to not make too many promises like that. Okay. So if I want to keep my promises, if I want to have integrity with you, it means we must communicate. There must be an exchange, a negotiation, if you will. While we both come to an agreement, this, this is how we will behave toward one another. Jeez, that makes my marriage pretty easy. I will stay faithful to this woman to the end of the road. Very easy. All I got to do is keep the promise. Okay. And she makes that very easy. But I have to keep that view. Okay. Now, one of the things that's done for me, quite honestly, has made me a safe man. Some of you ladies who've known me long enough know that. You can hug on me and you're safe because I'm safe. And it's a wondrous thing that happens because it lifts it to another place. Some of you guys know that I'll kiss you right on the mouth if you're not careful. Because that's non-sexual. Okay, I'll shake your hand, I'll hold you by the arm, I'll hug you, I'll kiss you on the cheek, and if you're loud, I'm going to kiss you right on the mouth. Loud is a friend of mine from Seattle. A lunatic. Lunatics need to be kissed on the mouth regularly. <laughs> Have you met Loudy? He's an old rock musician. He's stark raving bad. And I just love him. He and Gwen just had another baby. That's two of them. Oh, least likely father that you've ever considered. And he's thriving on it. Just thriving on it. Anyway. So there's another ideal. I would like to be safe. I would like to be a safe person. In whatever activity... I need to have enough integrity that you know you are safe with me. You know how I do that? That's easy. I rely upon God, and I'll let you know that right out front. I don't need anything from you. So I'm not going to be negotiating for my benefit. Because I don't need you. I don't need anything from you. I need you more than ever before. And these are the ideals that over the years begin to come. I want to be a good father. Well, one of my early sponsors when I had seven children, uh, that was an experience. And I got busy in AA. There's a difference between being busy and being active, and I had gotten busy. Pulled me aside one day and he said, you know, we're supposed to practice these principles in all of our affairs, and that means we have to practice them at home, too. And in order to do that, you got to be there once in a while. Oh. Have you ever listened to children? You want to be a good parent? Stop raising children the way most of us do. It's a criminal activity. 
We keep trying to impose ourselves and our dreams and our ideals on them and make them into something they aren't. So stop that. Start listening to children. That's what I've learned. You know what? You ever listen close to children? You know what their biggest bitch is? Nobody ever listens to me. You want to make friends with a child? Sit down for a minute and listen to them. They have very short attention spans. They're not going to take up much of your time. Okay. Pretty soon, you're dull. Don't go do something else. But listen to them. Isn't that our all of our... My ideal is to become a listener. And God has made me a listener, and I think you're funny because you asked me to talk. But I'm a listener. Want to be effective in working with people? Don't figure out what they need. Listen while they tell you what they need. Because they will. You have to really learn to listen because very few alcoholics ever say it straight. But they're saying it. Listen to me. You don't hear what I'm saying. I heard that from my older boy. It broke my heart because he was right. I wasn't hearing what he was saying. I was hearing what he was saying. Anyway, by praying for those ideals in all of my affairs, I can have affairs. As long as I don't have more affairs and I have principles, I'm fine. At work. Very important at work. Don't even want to go there right now. Maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow morning is crying time. I'm going to tell all kinds of emotional stories. All of us just bring you to tears. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it's going to be a three hanky morning. <laughs> <laughs> my ideal is, according to this, God is my employer. So, for many, many years, I've never worked for anybody but God. Now, he's given me numbers of human supervisors that paid my check. He has to find some way to get the money into my hands. But I don't work for you. I work for him. And you know, I've had amazing experiences there. I went to work at a correctional facility, and the first thing they did was take me out of the matrix. I was not subjected to any of the routines that all the other employees had to do because I worked harder than any of them. I work for God. That's a 24-hour day job. So instead of coming in at 9, I found that I could come in at 7 and get more work done between 7 and 9 than I could all day. And I don't mind that. That left me free time to actually work with people. And I don't want to go clear off into all that, but that's what comes out of these prayers. What should I do about each specific very important, and I'll, I'll, I'll pass this on. I, I work with a lot of people. Little Chuck was not capable of getting into the big book for almost a year. He was so badly damaged, I just kept him with me and rode around in my car and let him spew his hate. And, and couldn't get into it for almost a year. So I'm very patient with those kind. Not too long ago, fellow came to me who had been 17 years sober, relied entirely upon his sponsor and the 12 and 12. And had never worked the steps thoroughly. His sponsor did something that made him mad and then died. Now, God was gone. He was mad at him. There were no directions, so he drank so at 17 years. Of course he drank. He had no power. <laughs> He and I had met in, in Los Angeles on an airplane coming to, back to Denver, one of those crossroad deals about five years before, and we'd talked. So he called me and uh, asked me if I would take him through the steps and work with him, help him. And we were going along pretty good, but he, he couldn't stop drinking. Now, he's a holistic chiropractor. And the way God works is I get my information through strange ways. An Indian friend of mine wanted me to go to a holistic chiropractor for my feet. And this chiropractor suggested I take some adrenal cortex. I'm a label reader. I'm responsible for what goes in my body. It's 80% alcohol. All those herbal medicines are. And he's telling me that he doesn't understand it because he can't seem to get healthy. He's taking his own herbs and all. I thought, 
No wonder you haven't quit drinking. You haven't quit drinking. <laughs> went that out to him, and he quit drinking. And the craving went away, and we were going along pretty good. Had a good third step experience. Sent him home to make his list. And he made his list. And we set up an appointment, and he missed it. About two years ago, Christmas. And I didn't hear from him for a while. Called me back after. Now, he's got a habit of drinking, coming back, starting over, drinking, coming back, starting over. Called me, and he said, you know, I drank over the holiday. I said, I know you did. You want to know how I knew? Well, you didn't show up. That's how I knew. That's a no-brainer. So what should I do now? And I prayed for this specific instance and said, Ali, I think what you need to do is keep drinking. I think you need to drink until you discover for yourself that you cannot not drink. And when that day comes, call me back. Well, I found out the other night he called one of the guys I sponsored when he finally got to that place. <laughs> and John said, well, what did Don tell you to do when you got there? He said, you should call him. He said, well, I want you to call him, not me. And he called him. He said, now what do I do? And I prayed again. And I said to him, finish what you started. You've got your list. Now it's time to do that second and third column. I've shown you how to do that. When you're through with that, call me back. Months went by. Because he knows I mean it. Don't call me till you're through. Well, in the last month, we have had one of those rocketing into the fourth dimension experiences. Are we running out of time again? Go. Ten. About a month ago, he called me and he said, I'm through with the first three columns. And so I became immediately available. I had him come over that day. We went over that business in between, taught him how to pray there, and then go home and do that fourth column, which he had never done before and had resisted. In less than two weeks, he was done. I mean, he was really done. He was finished. So I had him out the next day, and we began his fifth step. It took two sessions to get it all done because it was fairly like I'm going to do two or three hours at a time because that's all I can do. I got it all done. Sent him home to do his own amends list, if you will. Because in my own experience, I know that he needs to become willing on his own to know precisely what he did wrong and what he thinks he can do about it and then have a mind open enough to say he may have missed something here so he can be open to any feedback the person gives. We got all that done. He came back, and he's got the whole eight-step thing written out. I mean, he's really... I wish you'd all behave like he did. <clears throat> and at the top of the list is one he's not really wanting to make. Not wanting to make. It's going to cost him some money and could even put him in jail if it's not done right. He's harmed somebody on a on a house fire deal. I don't want to get into any detail, but... He harmed an agent by making her look bad in front of her boss, uh, trying to get some money that really wasn't due him. It was one of those things that was in the gray area. Had a lawyer, and he's pissed off because all he's going to get back is $1,000, and it's already cost him $980 for a lawyer. And he just doesn't want to make this one. So I prayed about it. I said, you might as well go home. Because if you're not willing to do this one, none of the rest of them are going to make any sense either. There are other people I would say, just pick one, get started, and you get the power. But in this case, that's what came out. So do this. You go home and write a letter just as if you were willing to say what you're going to say to these people. And bring it back and let me take a look at it. In the meantime, pray for some willingness. That's what it says to do in the sixth step. Pray for the willingness. Took a couple days, but uh, he called me up and he read the letter to me. It was a masterpiece. He had already cut out the things that would 
make him look like a good guy and just laid it all out. The agent can't talk to him because he has a lawyer. An insurance agent is not allowed to talk to him, so he can't make it personally. And I keep insisting, you heard her face to face, you got to see her face to face. But he's done. He got it all done. He's laid it out on the line. He's fired his lawyer, and he's free. Now the rest of them are going to go, shoo, and we're going to have a tiger by the tail. And it's going to shake everybody in Denver A because they've been watching him for years. And he's a go out and start over, go out and start over, go out and start over. He is on fire. And I am in love with the way the process works. And all I did was pray at each juncture, well, what do I do here? Because that's what I've been told to do here. Each specific instance. The next guy I may say, here, let me help you with that. Let me go with you on this one. You never know, so stay open to that. I try to use the principles, not the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. Because I don't want to kill anybody. Now, I've yammered long enough on this kind of thing. I know these guys have a good deal to say. And we want to push on because we still got to make some amends. That's a tearjerker. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.